Good morning. I would encourage you to open up in your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. That's where I'm at. That's where we're going to read from in just a couple minutes. I would appreciate it if you would open up your Bibles to that. Follow along with us as we read here in just a couple seconds. I also appreciate the men, as I mentioned earlier, for taking part in our worship service this morning. Jeff Driggers, Russell Cook for leading prayers this morning. Uh, Curtis Little for his excellent words during the Lord's Supper. And then also Nathan for le- reading to us from uh, God's Word. I appreciate those men. appreciate their willingness to take part in the worship service. I really appreciate their their. Uh, uh, consideration, their willingness, like I said, to take part in that. Uh, this is a tricky situation, tricky scenario, but hopefully something that we'll navigate and we'll get through together. It is officially three days into the year 2021. And like most people, you've probably made New Year's resolutions for this year. You've thought to yourself, in 2021, I'm going to do this, this, and this. I'm going to go here. I'm going to accomplish this. I'm going to establish these habits. And like all New Year's resolutions, I pray that they hopefully will come through for you. But statistically speaking, many New Year's resolutions fail flat. And usually that's by reasons that are completely within our means. And and I am the king, by the way, of failed New Year's resolutions. I I think I've broken 10 times the amount that I've actually followed through on. But sometimes those New Year's resolutions are broken because of very understandable scenarios, uh, things that are very much within our control. We just, you know, I didn't get up in the morning to go jog or go to the gym. You know, I didn't uh, download Duolingo so that I could learn French. I, I didn't do these types of things. And that's all on me. I think, though, if you didn't have your New Year, didn't accomplish your New Year's resolution from 2020, in my opinion, you're probably a little bit forgiven this year, last year of any year. Because last year was one of those years that things just went completely haywire. I think it was right around middle of March when we decided to shut down in-person services and move exclusively to an online format, at least for a couple months. And then we live streamed them for several more months. And now we're doing digital again for these three weeks. But things just went completely crazy. But like all of us, we have those good intentions to follow through on them, even though sometimes they don't pan out. And as a church, when I got up and established a few at the beginning of this year, I established the theme for that year, for 2020, which was going to be a year in the mirror. And I was by no means the only preacher that had this kind of vision-oriented theme for 2020. But the ironic part of it is, is that as much as we you know, are looking back and the call was to look back and to see perfect vision, see what our lives are like and see what we can do and see how we can improve, nobody saw the pandemic happening. Nobody anticipated that thing eventually taking place and completely annihilating all the plans that we had for 2020. I think it was right around the middle of May that I looked at that that theme that I had here for the mirror, and I basically crumpled it up and threw it in the trash because there was no sense in following the theme anymore because there was no order to anything. It was just kind of week to week, month to month, hopefully getting through 2020. But I still think even though we didn't necessarily talk every single month about those different catchwords, you know, passion, integrity, and character, which was what we were trying to establish with that theme, I still think it accomplished its overall purpose. The overall point of that theme was to look back in our life and think to ourselves, how can I improve? How can I personally develop as a Christian? How can I grow? What can I do better? And so even though we didn't necessarily accomplish that theme here in the mirror, I still think the overall goal was somehow still accomplished. There's nobody listening to this right now that hasn't, in some form or fashion, taken stock of their life and found ways that they can improve on in the future. Anyone that looks back at 2020 and hasn't, isn't a better person because of that, I think hopefully you will do that in the near future because that is a year that is rife with lessons and things that all of us can take into consideration. And I think with that in mind, I want to announce the theme for this year. I know I just said that, that the theme last year was completely destroyed. I want to announce a new theme for this year. 2021, what the theme for Hillside is going to be is looking at, or I'm sorry, living life backwards. Now, when I say that, what I don't mean is that we're going to go back in time and relive 2020. Nobody wants that unless you had a fantastic year of 2020, then maybe you would like to go back and relive some of those things. But I would be willing to guess that nobody wants to go back and relive 2020. That's not my intention. What I do think we can do is look back at our life, take stock of it, And as we just mentioned earlier, see ways that we can improve. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, this is exactly what Solomon is getting at. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, starting in verse 1, Solomon writes, Remember also your creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near, when you will say, I have no delight in them, before the sun and the light, the moon and the stars are darkened, and the clouds return after the rain. And what he does here in these first couple of verses, he establishes a foundational principle. You need to remember your creator in the days of your youth. Focus on God when you're young. Now, the obvious question is, you know, why not every time else in life? Why not when you're older? Why not when you're in middle age? Why do you not want to focus on God at those points? 
And I don't think by any means what Solomon is saying is, is don't think about God when you're in your mid-30s or when you're in your late 70s. It's not his point. The point is, is that we need to establish a foundation of leaning on God early so that when times get tougher as we age physically, then we'll remember that hope and that help and that foundation that we have. So in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, he talks about the aging process in great detail. Verse 3, In the day that the watchmen of the house tremble, the mighty men stoop, the grinding ones stand idle, because they are few. And those who look through windows grow dim, the doors on the street are shut, as the sound of the grinding mill is low. And one will arise in the sound of the bird, and all the daughters of song will sing softly. And furthermore, men are afraid of a high place and of terrors on the road. The almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper drags himself along, the caperberry is ineffective. For man goes to his eternal home while mourners go about in the streets. Remember him before the silver cord is broken, the golden bowl is crushed, the pitcher by the well is shattered, and the wheel at the cistern is crushed. And then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. As Solomon investigates the aging process, what he does is establish these principles. He says, first and foremost, you need to remember God when you're young. So that when all these things happen, and all these things that he references there in verses 3 down through verse 6, all of those are various descriptions of the aging process. Until you finally get to that last one, when he talks about the cord is broken, the golden bowl is crushed, the pitcher by the well is shattered, the the golden cistern is crushed. All those things that he mentions there in verse 6 are euphemisms for death. Remember God before difficult days happen. Why is that? Because when those difficult days happen, you're going to be tempted to go places you shouldn't go. You're going to be tempted to think on things you shouldn't go. You're going to be tempted to build your hope on things that, quite frankly, do not last. So what he says here in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 1 is, Remember your Creator in the days of your youth. As Solomon investigates his life, and he investigates basically all of life throughout the book of Ecclesiastes, He finally arrives at the meaning of life. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, starting verse 13, the conclusion when all has been heard is is this. Fear God and keep his commandments because this applies to every person. For God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether good or evil. You can argue that Solomon's chief concern in the book of Ecclesiastes, besides the exploration of life and whether or not you can find immortality in the things of this world, you can argue that what Solomon's chief objective is is to create an ideal person of God. I'm going to explore these avenues. I'm going to explore these things. I'm going to investigate this scenario. I'm going to take this path, and I'm going to see if any of those things give me a better life than the one that I find with Jehovah. And if that answer is no, then I'm going to throw it to the side. If there's anything that I've investigated that trumps what I have in God, then I'm going to obviously follow that path. But what he finds out more oftentimes than not in this book, everything that he goes through, all those things pale in comparison to his life and to his relationship with Jehovah. He looks back on his life. He takes stock of it. And he says, these are the paths that I need to take. This is what I should have done with my life. I think there's a lot of value in us doing this. Now, even if you're not at the end of your life, even if you're nowhere near the end of your life, I think there's a lot of value in looking back and taking stock of your life and thinking to yourself, these are the paths that I should have taken. These are the choices that I should have made. This is what I should have done differently. Even if I did it 99% right, this is how I could have tweaked it and just made it a little bit better. I think when we live life backwards, by examining and by learning the lessons from our past, it's only by then that we can adequately live for the future. But I believe that we learn several things as we look at life backwards. Number one, what we remember is that disobedience is dangerous. You know, none of us, when we're in the moment, when we're going through life and we're confronted with sin, none of us see the full effects of those choices. We see what's happening in the moment. We see what's taking place right then, right there, right now. And we make our decision based on what we think will eventually benefit us the most. But unfortunately, too many of us, and self included in this, we make decisions based on short-term gains. We make decisions based on the things that gratify us in the moment rather than looking at the long-term game and thinking to ourselves, this will benefit me 20, 30, 50 years from now. I'm not an investor by any means. I don't have any financial, really, knowledge of any kind. But I really enjoy reading things that Warren Buffett has to say. And Warren Buffett talks about when he was very young in his life and he became a more or less professional investor by the time he was 13, 15 years old, something like that, bought his first stock at the age of 10, 
And what Warren Buffett realized when he was really young and kind of what set him on the path of value investing, which is the idea of buying stock and holding it for 20, 30, 40 years at a time, what helped Warren Buffett make his billions is when, and he relates this in his biography, he talks about a moment when his mom asked him to go down to the store to buy an ice cream cone. And she gave Warren Buffett a dime or a dollar or whatever it was in that day, went down to buy an ice cream cone. And on the way there, he realized I could use this dollar to buy an ice cream cone that I'll eat and then it'll go away eventually. And, the, and the, the, the pleasure of that is gone within minutes. Or I can save it and I can keep it. I can invest it. And what I know based on that is that 30, 40 years, 50 years down the road, that dollar, that dime is going to be worth a whole lot more down the road. He calls it, I think, his $38,000 ice cream cone. Because what he realized is that while that ice cream cone is worth a dollar today, 50 years from now, that ice cream cone's worth about $38,000. The ability to look at the long term of things, the ability to look at scenarios and look at your life, not in terms of what you're doing right now, but where your life will be down the road. And unfortunately, none of us have that ability. When we're faced with the temptation to either sin or to not to sin, we know in our hearts what we should be doing. We know that we shouldn't take that path. And yet for the moment, we think to ourselves, maybe I'll take this just a little bit. I'll dip my toe in that water. I'll go a little bit down that stream because after all, if I can reap a little bit of the benefits without going too far, then everything will be fine. It's only by looking back that we see the dangers of disobedience and how much that sin really cost us in the long run. I want you to look in 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I love what Paul has to say here. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, starting in verse 1, he talks about kind of two halves. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 is written more or less in, in two halves. These 13, 14 verses, two halves of it. And the first half, he describes how everything is the same. Everybody that came out of Israel walked the same path. But it's only upon the decisions and the choices that they made that their path started to diverge a little bit. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the first few verses, what you notice is this commonality. Verse 1, For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food. All drank the same spiritual drink. For they were all drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them. And the rock was Christ. So right here at the outset, first four verses, there is no difference between those people that came out of Egypt. They all walked the same. They all talked the same. They all came from the same place. They all had the same type of experiences. They all had the same opportunities. And yet, verse 5, with most of them, God was not well pleased, for they were laid low in the wilderness. Now, I know this is a passage you've probably heard a number of different times, on a number of different occasions, but imagine you're reading this for the first time. And imagine you're reading these first five verses and you see all this commonality between these people. And then you see in verse five, nevertheless, with most of them, God was not well pleased. The thing that's going to trigger in your mind is why? What changed? Because all I see are similarities. That's what he dives into in verse six. Now, these things happen as examples for us so that we would not crave evil things as they also craved. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. For as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and they stood up to play. Nor let us act immorally, as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in one day. Nor let us try the Lord, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the serpents. Nor grumble, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now you have the full view of verse 5. Because in verses 1 through 4, while he describes the commonality between these people, now in verses 6, 8, 9, and 10, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, now you start to see what made them different. And what made them different was their grumbling, was their immorality, was their sin. That's what made them different. Unless you think that Paul in this passage is kind of pulling random occurrences out of thin air and saying, you know, this happened, this happened, this happened. These are all just kind of generic examples. All of these things most likely have references to very literal events. In verse 7, when he talks about this idolatry, that most likely has a reference to the golden calf. And you know the events I'm talking about. We're not less than two months after they had left Egypt. The Israelites are at the base of Mount Sinai. Moses is up at the top receiving the law from God. He's up there for 30, 40 days. The people below start to get impatient. And as they start to get impatient, they begin to think, well, maybe God has destroyed Moses. Maybe Moses has left. Maybe Moses isn't even there anymore. So what we're going to do is we're going to make a representation of God in this calf. We're going to worship that. And that inflames God. To the point that he's willing to annihilate all those people that he just brought out of Egypt 
with a snap of his fingers. And because Moses intervened, he didn't. But you can see right there that the choices that they made at the base mountain is what led many of them to die. And there were deaths as a result of that sin. In verse 8, when he talks about the immorality, that's most likely the sexual immorality that occurs right after Balaam concursed them. Remember, Balaam's the one with the talking donkey, the donkey that told him not to go. Balaam hits the donkey. They keep going. Balaam arrives, can't curse the people of Israel. Most people think when you look at the chapters after that, when the people are led into sexual immorality, that's Balaam's doing. That Balaam is the one that did that. Did that. And I think it's Jude that also talks about people rushing headlong into the air of Balaam. Same type of thing. The sexual immorality that takes people apart from God. Verse 9, when it talks about trying the Lord, it most likely be referred to the waters of Meribah. Verse 10, the reference to the grumbling, most likely the food. And the mutiny that resulted from them saying, why are you giving us this food? This is nauseating to me. When you zoom out and you notice all these things that he talks about, these two halves, he references the fact that all of them had the same opportunities. All of them could have done a number of different things, and they all had the opportunity to make it to Canaan, and yet most of them didn't make it. But the reason they didn't make it was because of their own choices. Now, here's the kicker. All of us, if we look back at these people, we think to ourselves, why is it that they mutinied? Why is it that they grumbled? Why is it that they engaged in sexual immorality? Why do they do those types of things? It doesn't make sense to us. Here's what, I'm, here's what I do want to say. All disobedience, at least that I can think of, nearly all disobedience sounds good in the moment. You can justify anything you want in the moment. If you're presented with a sinful option, if you're presented with something to do that you know up here is immoral, that you shouldn't be doing, you know it intellectually, but in the moment, humans have a way of rationalizing that. Humans have a way of taking situations and making them sound not nearly as bad because of their own opinions, because of their own input, because of their own perspective on the situation. When you look, for instance, at Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve are, are standing in the garden, and Eve is, is describing to Satan how God has told them that you can eat from any tree of the garden except that one, and Eve gives that command to Satan, says, this is why I'm not going to eat it. And then Satan introduces a little bit of doubt, and Satan says, did God really say that? Now you've got question marks in Eve's mind. And Eve then says that she sees that the tree is good for food, it's good to make one wise, so why should I not eat it? The command is put to the side, the choice is made to be in or disobedient towards God. All disobedience in the moment sounds good, it sounds reasonable. It's only when we look back on that disobedience that we see the evil that it can bring. In James, the first chapter, for example, you can see how quick this disobedience can creep up. In James chapter 1, a passage that describes the very nature of sin itself. In James chapter 1, verse 12, he says, Blessed is the man who perseveres in a trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. So there's the goal, the perseverance, pushing through the hard times, pushing towards God. Verse 13, Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. With verse 13, James lays down the ultimatum that you are responsible for your own decisions. If I choose to go down this path, it's because of the path, it's because of the choice that I made. Not the choice that somebody else made. It's not God's fault. It's my fault. Verse 14, each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. And then when lust is conceived, it, brings, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. It's so easy for us to be deceived, isn't it? It's so easy for us to look at situations and try to rationalize our way through the disobedience. And even though we know intellectually what's wrong, it's so easy for us to look at that situation and change just a few features, introduce a few question marks, and all of a sudden that sin that we know intellectually is wrong, all of a sudden that sin appears just a little bit better. It's so easy to be deceived. I think it's worth noting, by the way, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the verse right after we stop, verse 14, he says, flee from idolatry, my brethren. That's the same attitude we need to have. The attitude that we have when we look at sin and we flee from idolatry. Well, once we recognize it, we don't give it a foothold in our life, but we look at it, we recognize it for the danger that it presents, and we run from it. And even though those are great things to do in the moment, it's only by looking back on our life that we realize sometimes the mistakes that we made, the things that we rationalized, and the things that we kind of talked ourselves into 
although it didn't require that much convincing, the things that we talked ourselves into, we can see the danger from that. And we can see what it cost us. That's exactly what happened to David. I bet you anything, if David could look, redo his life and go back on his life and redo certain moments, that moment where he went up on the roof and saw Bathsheba afar off, he would change that moment every single time because of what it cost him. That's the value of looking back, is we see the danger, the real inherent danger that existed within that disobedience. Number two, I'll tell you number two, the thing that we realize when we look back is that it's all going to be okay. Beginning of this year, none of us knew what COVID-19 was. Within two months' time, all of us knew what COVID-19 was. And even though we knew what COVID-19 was on the surface, we didn't really understand it. And I think that that lack of understanding of what this disease actually was is what prompted most of the fear. Now, a lot of that fear was well-founded. A lot of people lost their lives. I think it was several hundred thousand people have lost their lives indirectly or directly related to COVID-19 complications or COVID-19 itself. So a lot of that fear was founded. But I think looking back on it, we didn't realize all the things then. And so we, we hunkered down, we, we sheltered up, and we, and we used masks, and we still use masks because we recognize the fear. But it's only now, looking back on it, that we can look at the future and say, everything's going to be okay. We just went through a global pandemic that cost the world millions of lives. And I'm not trying to minimize that expense at all. But here we stand on the other side of that. And at the beginning, when there was so much danger and there was so much unknown and there was so much fear and trepidation, and most of us wondered if we would even live to see the year 2021, we now realize everything's going to be okay. And even for those people who did lose their lives, I'm not saying that they were wrong or that they were weak or anything like that, but even those people who did lose their lives, those who were faithful towards God, they're with God right now. And so sometimes I think we give too much place to worry and too much place to fear and not enough faith and hope in the fact that God is ultimately going to protect us. I love what Jesus has to say in Matthew, the sixth chapter. In Matthew, chapter six, in the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus, at various times in the Sermon on the Mount, he goes through a bunch of you know, different types of concepts and some of which he lays down very harshly. He has very harsh words to say to these people. And other times he tries to encourage them to think about life a little bit differently but in Matthew, the sixth chapter, verses 25 through 32, he kind of dials it back a little bit. And he gives people a little bit more reason to be hopeful and to be joyful and to be confident as long as they're obedient to God. In Matthew, the sixth chapter, starting verse 25, he says, For this reason I say to you, don't be worried about your life, as what you'll eat or what you'll drink, nor for your body as to what you'll put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air that they don't sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? And why are you even worried about clothing? Observe the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't toil, nor do they spin. And yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today, tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Do not worry then, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear for clothing? For the e for Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. What Jesus is not addressing in this part of the Sermon on the Mount, what he's not addressing is the idea that we don't need to go out and have a job. We don't need to go down to you know, to clothing stores and buy clothes for ourselves. We don't need to go grocery shopping because after all, God's going to drop that in our lap. That is not what God is talking about. What Jesus is addressing this passage is this kind of unequitable fear that these things are not somehow going to produce themselves. That somehow, despite the fact that they're all present, that you can go and buy clothes and that money is in your bank account, no matter how much or how little, that these basic necessities are not going to somehow be given to you. And he's not saying that you don't need to work for these things. What he's saying is don't let it consume your mind. And I'll be honest with you, ladies and gentlemen, at the beginning of 2020, when we first started hearing about the coronavirus, it dominated my mind. And I began to think about what if? And what if we don't live to see the end of this year? What if one of my family members doesn't live to see the end of this year? What I need to realize, number one, is that it's all going to work out somehow. But even if it claims my life, if my hope is fixed firmly where it needs to be, then everything will naturally end up okay. As he says here in verses 32 through 33, your father knows that you need all these things. Focus on God and his righteousness. 
all these things will happen or will be added unto you. If my hope and my fixation is on Christ, then no matter what happens to me in this life, everything is going to work out okay. And that's what we need to remember. That's what we need to realize. And that's what we see when we look back on life. And not just in the year 2020, but I would imagine at various points in your life, there were times when you looked at your life and said, I don't know how I'm going to make it. And there are probably lots of people that are listening to this right now that have pillowed their head on more than one occasion and not known how they were going to pay the light bill that was due tomorrow. You lost your job. Family member has terminal illness. How am I going to get through these things? And yet here you are. It's only by looking at life backwards that we realize somehow through pain and through hardship, we made it. Everything somehow lets us arrive at this destination. When I think about this story, I think so much about the story of Joseph. And I think sometimes when we look at the story of Joseph in the Old Testament, we don't realize just what he went through. And this was a guy that had his whole life in front of him. He was somebody who had enjoyed the, the, the love of his father above any of the rest of his brothers. He was somebody who seemed to have it all right in front of him. And then before he was 20 years old, he sold him to slavery. And we know eventually how Joseph's life ends. We know that he eventually ascends to the second in command of all Egypt in charge of the food distribution to take care of the entire nation. But there was a lot of time that he was spent in prison. For instance, in Genesis chapter 37, verse 2, it states that he was 17 years old when he was sold into slavery. Genesis chapter 41, verse 46, states that he was 30 years old when he became second in command under Pharaoh. And so there was a whole bunch of years, 13 years to be exact, where Joseph was kind of left wallowing. And although some of that time was spent in Potiphar's household enjoying a very luxurious existence, most of that time, I would argue to you, was spent in prison. And Joseph didn't know that he would be second in command under Pharaoh. He didn't know what would eventually become in his life. But he knew that as long as he kept his faith in God, everything somehow, some way, would turn out okay. When his brothers eventually caught up with him later, after Joseph ascends to the second in command under Pharaoh, when his brothers eventually meet him, they do so with trepidation. In Genesis, the 50th chapter, we find that Joseph and his brother's dad has passed away. And his brothers come up to Joseph, and they're worried about their life. Obviously, they should be. They're the ones that sold Joseph into slavery. And as the little brother, I can tell you affirmatively that you're going to be looking for payback at least a little bit. Even if you don't entertain it for very long, you're thinking about it for a few seconds. And so Joseph most likely thought, how can I get back at my brother? And there is that, that episode where he sends him back and he kind of toys with them for a few months. But Joseph never really exacts the type of revenge that most people would have had they been placed in a very similar scenario. But in Genesis, the 50th chapter, starting in verse 15, it says, When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, What if Joseph bears a grudge against us, pays us back in full for all the wrong which we did to him? So they sent a message to Joseph, saying, Your father charged before he died, saying, Thus so you say to Joseph, Please forgive, I beg you, the transgression of your brothers and their sins, for they did you, they did you wrong. Now, please forgive the transgression of the servants of God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. The brothers hedge their bets. They say, remember, whenever your father, our father was still alive, he told you to go easy on us. We're asking you in the name of his memory to go easy on us. But listen to what Joseph says here. Joseph, verse 19, says to them, do not be afraid, for am I in God's place? In other words, is it up to me to issue judgment on your souls and on your lives? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. So therefore, don't be afraid. I'm going to provide for you and for your little ones. I don't know if Joseph knew that he would ever ascend to the second in command. Obviously, he had the dreams with the sheaths bowing down to him. He knew that there would be some interaction that he would have with his brothers later in life where they would eventually probably apologize for all the things they did to him, honor him in some way. I don't know if Joseph knew where he would eventually be. It was only by looking back on his life that Joseph was able to determine that that slavery, that bondage that he was in, ended up working out for the greater good. Because by that event that seemed terrible at the time, it brought about the physical salvation of an entire nation. That's the power of looking backwards. When we look back on our lives, we begin to see that things work out. And that those hardships that we exist in in the moment may somehow just lead to either our salvation, the salvation of other people. Number three, finally, I would argue that by looking back, we ultimately see what our lives are all about. Throughout the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon is 
just completely immersed in this idea of pleasure. He's immersed in this idea of wisdom and of foolishness and of power and of money and of possessions. And he, he navigates that course very skillfully. And he says, I gave my mind over towards money. I gave my mind over to pleasure. I gave my mind over to these things to see if there's any value in those types of things. And what he learned ultimately in the end, that everything else notwithstanding, the only truly important thing that mattered was that he fear God and keep his commandments. And as long as that core is intact, ladies and gentlemen, nothing else really matters. I fear too often times we forget that. When we look at our lives and we think to ourselves, all the things that we've gone through, we look at the future and we think, how am I going to navigate 2021? How am I going to navigate 2022? I fear too often times what we do is we forget to keep, as somebody has wisely said, forget to keep the main thing, the main thing. And the main thing, ladies and gentlemen, is not your retirement package. The main thing, ladies and gentlemen, is not my next car or my next home or our next vacation. The main thing, as Solomon says, is to fear God and keep his commandments. When we look back on our lives, we remember what life is all about. The book of Jeremiah chapter 6. Jeremiah is dealing with a group of people who are completely obstinate. People who are annihilated, people who are being punished for their sins. In Jeremiah chapter 6, he implores them to forget about all the things that they put stock in, all the things that they love, all the things that they hope, and remember what's truly important. Jeremiah chapter 6, starting in verse 9. Jeremiah chapter 6, starting in verse 9. Thus says the Lord of hosts, they will thoroughly glean as the wine, as the vine, the remnant of Israel. Pass your hand again like a grape gatherer over the branches. To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ears are closed and they can't listen. Behold, the word of the Lord has become a reproach to them. They have no delight in it. But I am full of the wrath of God. I am weary with holding in it. Pour it on the children in the street and on the gathering of young men together. For both husband and wife shall be taken. The aged and the very old. The houses will be turned over to others. Their fields and their wives together. For I will stretch out my hand against the inhabitants of the land, declares the Lord. For I am the least of them, even to the greatest of them. Everyone is greedy for gain. And from the prophets, even to the priest, everyone deals falsely. They have healed the brokenness of my people superficially, saying, peace, peace, but there is no peace. Were they ashamed because of the abomination they have done? They were not even ashamed at all. They did not even know how to blush. Therefore, they shall fall among those who fall. And at the time that I punish them, they shall be cast down, says the Lord. One word that sums up what we just read is chaos. These are people that are in complete disarray. They don't know what's happening to them. They recognize the punishment, but they're not, no, they don't know what's happening they're so lost in their own little world that they don't even realize that God is punishing them for their sins. And they don't recognize the word of the Lord. And even the people that are supposed to be the spiritual leaders, the priests, the prophets, the rulers, these are people who are supposed to be in charge of their souls and help navigate them through crises like this. They're in it for themselves, dealing with bribery, thieving from each other. Their lives are in complete chaos. Listen to what he says here in verse 16. Thus says the Lord, stand by the ways and see and ask for the ancient paths. For the good way is and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. Our world sometimes can turn into chaos. And as we navigate the various challenges that we deal with in this life and all the different struggles that we deal with, all the things that we face in this life every single day, it can be very easy to lose the most important thing. And that's why Jeremiah implores them in the midst of all this punishment, all this chaos, all this you know, haywireness that's going on, it's not even a word, all this craziness that's happening, he implores them to stand by and seek for the ancient paths. Ask about the will of God. See what truly is the most important, and you will find rest for your souls. It's only by looking backwards sometimes in these times of trials, in these periods of tribulation, that we remember to keep the main thing, the main thing. When Jesus was asked by the rich young ruler, what's the most important thing of the law, Jesus didn't list all 632 laws what he said was fear god keep his commandments or love god with all your heart soul and mind and love your neighbor as yourself that's the main thing keeping that the main thing and as if to put a little bow on it he said for on this hang all the law and the prophets 
It's so hard sometimes as we're striving to do God's will. We think about baptism. We think about prayer. We think about Bible study. We think about repentance. We think about evangelism. We think about biblical authority and all the things that we need to have in place in our life. But all of those things come around one unifying thought, which is to fear God and keep his commandments. By looking back on our life and by living life backwards, we remember to keep the main thing the main thing. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful that you've given us this new year that we're able to worship and to glorify you. We're thankful, Lord, that we have the last few years and the last several years of our life to learn from. We're thankful that we have all the different experiences that we've gone through, the good things and the bad, Lord. And no matter whether they were good or bad, we pray, Lord, that you would help us to learn from those times. We pray that you would help us to live life backwards, to examine the situations that we are in so we can best understand how to move forward in our life. Pray, Lord, that no matter what we do in our life, that we would look to you for guidance. We would keep you front and center in everything that we do and fix our eyes and fix our hope firmly on you. These things we pray in your son's name.